नमस्ते सिद्धार्थ वेलकम वेलकम टू आर हिमसा कॉन्वर्सेशन थैंक्स फॉर मेकिंग टाइम वॉट इज योर अर्लीस्ट रिकलेक्शन of a himsa either as an experience or a concept we're jumping right into it 90s you could say the the 90s were some of my formative years like my teen years were spent in the 90s in the city of mumbai and mumbai went through a very interesting transformation and perhaps the country as well or you know perhaps india as well very early in the 90s i'm sure you know most would know about the communal riots that occurred in mumbai and for me there was a very interesting moment as an 11 12 year old observing it uh, i was of course delighted that my school was closed for a couple months um but i think it represented a transformation of sorts or a transition of sorts that the world was going through um where or at least in india it manifested as communal life giving way to this wave of new liberalism that was sweeping across the world um and for me as an 11 or 12 year old you know who had seen you know my early years were part of you could say a very socialist india on one hand but also very communal india where you had all of these different cultures that were you know that were organizing and coordinating with each other and and i had the experience so that, of so yeah. that you are using the word communal in its proper dictionary and positive yes. sense <laughs> I I that just wanted correct. to clarify right Yeah and I might also use the word tribal in the in that sense not in a, in a positive sense in a positive sense Okay go um, ahead sorry to interrupt or, or let me frame it in in the neutral sense and then I think there are also those shadow sides to communal slash tribal organizing right like on one hand you know it is very em- it it embraces culture of the group but at the same time that same culture can also be become very inward looking um and so my parents were from different parts of india culturally very different and so it was very interesting for me to constantly have to hop between cultural identities and so you know you could see how culture was at play in all kinds of organizing in india at that point and around that time you know when the riots occurred it felt like there was a trade off of sorts um because you could see a large enough mass in the country of india saying you know this communal life is not leading us anywhere like we you know we're cobbling and bickering among each other there's no real economic progress but at the same time if we embrace this wave of neoliberalism that was sweeping across the across the world we could participate in this new transparent economic boom of sorts um and so i brought that up because i think that links to my early experiences of the word nonviolence and a lot of that you know as an 11 12 13 year old like that word landed on me you know in conversations in in social contexts where people were you know speaking about nonviolence in a fairly negative light because you could see a very devolved version of how gandhi might have practiced nonviolence right like and so things like the bhook hartals or labor unions that were holding back economic progress um for an 11 12 year old that was very format you know formative because on one side if we embrace this western way of doing things you know we could give give up like the old daddy um fadi daddy approach to you know holding on to culture book hartals of sorts which which felt very um, siddharth when you yeah, say book hartal here means hunger strike uh, and yes. are you referring to it as a method of persuasion change hmm. by persuasion yeah. change by moral yes. pressure is what yes. you are you are uh, yes. expressing here as your view of non violence at the age of 12 or 13 yeah. am i correct thank you thank you for clarifying yes um and obviously as a 12 or 13 year old you don't know better um and so that the first impressions of non violence were actually quite negative for me in that sense because it was exactly what you said this you know this transformation through moral coercion almost um and it um, and 
obviously in on reflection you know today i look back and see yeah that was obviously not how non violence is meant to be practiced but it was a fairly devolved version of 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 the principle of non violence um and so i brought that up because my first experiences of non violence were therefore in a very negative light as a very like old outdated concept something that um, was holding us back something that was holding us back exactly you know these people in khadi who walk around with cholas um restricting so, progress so said then the symbolism of khadi was it equated with or oh, simplicity versus uh, uh you know consumer uh, paradise of spend 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 is that what yeah. was happening or that, that came later that is a good analogy i think that is a good analogy because as a 12 13 year old you know there is a wonderland outside of the boundaries of india where levis and video games and nike shoes exist and these people in khadi and are in endless supply are, did you endless you, supply right yeah no but said yeah. you grew up in a very affluent household did you ever experience a sense of scarcity versus what was outside india as representing complete abundance I would say my parents were the product of that embrace of western capitalism or neoliberalism whatever you might call it before that they very much like most self-made intellectuals in the country of india um there was a restriction at a material level and so growing up as a kid in a middle class household there was very much this lust for the nike shoes and the reglies chewing gums um and nintendo video games um and like i said you know these outdated values were holding us back um and so um, uh, sorry sorry the outdated yeah. value being to look down upon these desires would being the outdated yeah, yeah. or you could say a very moralistic approach towards things ah. you could say you could say um this belief of shunning materialism um and i think y- y- misinterpreting nonviolence as a way to to how would you say um to enforce some of these values um and so yeah so i would say i had i received a very distorted form understanding of nonviolence and that definitely biased my understanding it in i would say in my formative years like you know going into my 20s um and so going into business school going into capital markets it was very much about embracing this new system of abundance or perceived abundance um while letting go of you know these these quaint old ideas would uh, said would progress also be a word that was relevant here that what you were embracing represented progress yeah. whereas yeah. what what needed to be left behind was uh not only outdated but regression of some kind is that what was happening yeah bickering tribalism so as a kid you know i i watched people burn each other alive during the riots and that left a very you know a mark in my mind um about what community life could devolve down into what people could be you know devolving into can devolve into um my parents were products like i have you know a lot of gratitude for them because they broke out of some of these shackles of communal life and over the last 20 to 30 years have shown their family you know if you are willing to bring forth professionalism a desire to work hard you can you know you can let go of some of these tribal instincts um, and today they're highly regarded in their you know their respective communities because of this approach so um i think at a very young age i could see that dynamic you know like on one side my parents you know f- ho- feeling the pressure of these communities but them embracing professional life in different ways you know broke them out of it and actually as a you know as a teenager it brought many goodies for me like you said you know i think that embrace of affluence occurred as a result of this leap into neoliberalism um and we all know the western neoliberal values which is um you know to some extent even suppressing our cultural identities in order to participate in global commerce um and so i feel at a very young age i could i could sense there was a trade off there and i was willing to make that trade off that that 
um, that what's the, what's the word? I guess a bargain of sorts. Like yes, mute this part of you in order to get you know a bunch of other things. Hmm. Um, and Is so it wasn't with a sense you... of idealism. Sorry, is that what led you to business school? To to you chose to do an MBA at India's premier yeah. uh, institution, then join the stock market. So you're saying this, in a sense, was the background which made you, which led you to those choices. Absolutely, um, I you could say an extended version of my parents' success hmm. um, was yes, business school is the way. At that point, around 2003 and four, there was this big boom around emerging markets where really countries like Brazil, Russia, India, China were embracing um, capitalism in a very neoliberal way. And there was at that point some amount of idealism, like, you know, a country like India does have a bunch of um, issues and problems, and capital markets can actually solve those problems. Um, and so, Again, like at that point, looking at values like nonviolence and very antiquated, looking at them as very antiquated and not relevant and jumping forward into, you know, these new systems that could potentially deliver us into, you know, into the new heaven as such. Um, yeah, so business school followed, trading mark, the, you know, trading flow followed, which I personally enjoyed quite a bit because, you know, vocationally, I'm very suited quantitatively towards numbers and and i think markets are fundamentally uh reflections of human emotion so it was just glorious sometimes to sit on the trading floor and observe like very basal emotions like greed and fear at play um and um i still look back at those times fondly um yeah. Yeah. because there was something to that time yeah and yet something changed something <laughs> uh something yeah. bothered you enough that you walked away why and what was that um, yeah, quite a bit of, uh, this, th that step has been quite romanticized. Um, and I think around 2008 and nine and 10, that trade-off or that, you know, the, the bargain that we made in the early nineties, I think had started catching up with us, um, because neoliberalism was meant to rescue us from the perils of tribalism and communalism and you know leave all those old ideals behind and embrace the new um, but obviously we had muted our cultural identities because that kind of commerce or you know the the global markets as such relies on a certain level of homogeneity um, so if you are to participate in global markets at a global level you have to mute your cultural identity. I'm not saying you can't go into global markets and speak any language. You know, I think people, you know, tend to talk about, oh, you know, multiculturalism as a very surface level thing. But I think we know this as South Asians. Um, there are so many different ways of being. Um, but there is only one way of being that brought us commercial prosperity over the last 20 to 30 years which is the global way of being. You could say it is also a proxy for the American way of being, right? Um, and so all of us intuitively understand that and feel that like, you know, there is on, like all of these other identities are kind of on the side, but there is one way if you want to monetize or benefit monetarily. And so sitting on a trading floor and at that point, one of the largest trading floors in South Asia, you could literally feel the effect of homogenization which is, you know, generations of cultural identities, generations of, of intelligence, social intelligence, being flattened down onto one dimension. And so you would have these situations where progress was being, you know, progress was someone from Kutch who had layers of cultural identities, but got a job at a McDonald's. Um, and I'm not taking the stance of, oh, that was evil of McDonald's. I don't think so. Like, um, I think that again was a trade-off that that person, you know, with those, with that heritage or, or ancestry chose at that point, because that was what was relevant for them. Um, but that homogenization I could see was occurring, I think had brought about some amount of prosperity, but in a region like India, 
it was proving to be disastrous because it was starting to create social friction. I think it was starting to create fractures, which were very new apparent fractures. to me at the time. Were this, did this seem yeah. like new fractures? I think were- over the last 20, you know, from 90s to 2010, about 20 years of suppressing was starting to bring about like a re- were creating a repression of sort and it was, you know, coming out in different ways. Um, and as all of us are getting to be more subservient to the to the to the god that is global markets, um, I think all of those you know cultural identities had to start coming out in different ways. And my you know reading of the last ten years has been has been that like I feel like there's been you know cultural repression of sorts, and which is why this embrace of tribalism in such a in such a what's the word not the most healthiest way. What did you perceive to be the nature of the structural violence uh, Mm. at the material level even of Mm. this global market, uh, Mm. market based on greed and fear? Uh, Mm. What was what was the nature of it that you perceived? Can you describe it a bit? Yeah, yeah. I think you can look at it from different angles. Um, One of them is its reliance on infinite growth, right? Um, This belief, obviously, that, you know, we have an infinite set of resources and that organizations or companies just can can continue growing. Um, And I don't, you know, I think that has been talked about quite a bit. And I think, you know, quite a few people see it and have been calling it out. And I think that is a legitimate question. um, And one that, you know, needs aggressive answering. Um, For me, it was always the, a couple of things like, there was a need for consensus um, that drove global markets. And I'll explain what I mean by that. By consensus, I mean, and this is a term that comes from, you know, my industry today of distributed ledgers or blockchains, where there is a shared understanding of what is the universal truth. Okay, did Rajni do this at that point of time? All 7 billion people in the world must arrive at the conclusion of this is what happened. And the reliance on such consensus, in my opinion, act you know affects a certain violence on the people within that system um and obviously with the last 20 to 30 years with our reliance on liberal democracy we've used democratic structures to arrive at those you know states of consensus which then support global markets uh, and so you could see it in India because all of these different cultures and ways of being, you could say states, but I think in India, it goes down to like every, you know, small radius of as small as 30 to 50 kilometers as its own identity and cultural way of being, but were being almost coerced into one, conform, you know, overarching consensus and, and democracy does have that dark side to it. Um, yeah. And I, I don't, criticize it as evil i think it is the best we knew at that time, at that point of time um, because the co- you know, because also, the coercion is rather invisible i think yes um it also you know comes with the the frills of of um you believing you have choice yeah. um because you know there is so much romanticism around you casting your vote um no and also your choice in how you spend the money in your wallet Yep, that choice exactly. has also that, been yeah, very highly yeah. uh, exalted as meaning yeah. much more than it may actually uh, mean in a in a mm. in a holistic sense. Mm. And very interestingly, that feeds into uh, notions of independence, of financial independence. You know mm. that I think all of us are today products of or conditioned by at some level. And I tend to think about that notion of financial independence as the modern day divide and rule. You know, we've, we've understood divide and rule as, in, you know, as, as a strategy used by the British. But I think it is also a very interesting strategy to prevent mutual dependence and coordination among people. Because 
if Sid aspires to be financially independent, he is less likely to be looking out for people around or even seeking that kind of interdependence with people around. Um, and so I think personally as well, um, in my journey as an entrepreneur, I have felt a lot of shame. My biggest fears are not actually dying or something horrible happening to me, but this fear of, oh my God, I might actually be dependent financially on someone if I fail. Um, and that fear, you know, co-opts me personally, and I can see in so many other people as well, uh, into actually creating any kind of transformation in society. And so for me, that notion of financial independence seems like a modern day divide and conquer, like, um, don't rely on your fellow people, rely on the nation state. Like that's, you know, that's don't rely the, on the mutual fund. Yeah. Rely on the mutual fund. Exactly. Can you try to recall at a more visceral level? See, this is your analysis in retrospect also mm. to a large yeah. extent. Can yeah, you, yeah. is there any visceral element of that decision that, you know, took you from the Lal street in Mumbai to uh, Gandhi <laughs> ashram in Ahmedabad? Well, Personally, I could see this was an outdated system. The stock market. And yeah, the global market system, like the global, the global market. markets, you could say. And, you know, in 2008, one of my biggest clients, Lehman Brothers, that I had grown up romanticizing, right? Like all the way from the late 90s to business school, to trading floor, like, you know, the big Goliaths of Wall Street, like that is who I, we romanticized. And we said, hey, this is the system as opposed to, you know, the communal riots in Mumbai, like let go of like that, that, that bickering and embrace this new way of being. And 2008 showed just how fragile it is, right? And, and maybe there's viewers who aren't familiar with 2008, like it's, it's <laughs> I guess we've come a long way. Um, but it is shocking how we have not learned any lessons from it. It is shocking that it was not a one-off it is it it was actually the result of a system working to the way it was meant to be like all through 2008 you know there's movies being made about it now and documentaries made about it now as like oh my god like this happened and that happened and that's presented almost as like this black swan event like you know like the perfect storm but in reality it's like as living through it myself i was part of it i could see how this, this, you know, 2008, the crash and the collapse was so inevitable. Like it was not even, a, it's not even a shock really. Um, and so I could see at that point of time, there is something seriously wrong with the system. And I think as Indians who've been through that transition of, you know, uh, the nineties where, you know, we moved away from socialist communal, communal, com you know, country towards a more capitalist system i think we tend to look at these systems in a much more objective right light as compared to let's say you know today western societies where they've only been in one way of being and so they can't imagine worlds outside of this and so today i think of it as a gift but back then i i don't think i was a visionary I, but it was just my experience that taught me like, oh, this system that we adopted for the last 20 years is seriously flawed. We need to figure shit out or we will all collapse. And I didn't know what the problem was, but I could see it was, you know, definitely not working apart from like some of the social fractures that you were witnessing in society. I could very clearly see inequality was rising this dream that markets are going to allow capital to flow down and create you know the middle class dream it was by 2010 it was very much gone i think i do think in 2000 you know up until 2008 and 9 like it did function to some level and you could argue like you know countries like china have benefited from that system but i think thomas piketty in the book capitalism the 21st century outlines it beautifully well where he very simply lays out this machine is not going to deliver a quality of outcome. It's going to worsen inequality. And it's so beautifully and simply and rationally put that I don't see how anyone could argue it. And so sitting on the trading floor, I could make sense. Well, this, this is just going to make, you know, create like the output of this machine is flawed. Uh, and not because the input is flawed, but because the machine was designed 200 years ago and it is 2020 now, and we need to change that machine. It was designed for an industrial revolution. 
And since then, my analysis is we have migrated out of the industrial revolution and I think are very much now in an informational era where a much larger footprint of our coordination lies in the digital realm. I think COVID has really made that very apparent. Yeah. Uh, but so again, before, I'm not romanticizing, I'm not saying this is like a beautiful evolution. I'm just saying it is, it is. Yeah, yeah. Like I don't, yeah. yeah. And, and that's what we are here to talk about. But before we yeah. go to that, can you yeah. spend a little time on the Gandhi Ashram years and what yeah. counter worldview they offered mm. And uh, uh, and you not just you didn't just ha hang around you know you did an uh, experiment. Some would say I did, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you did an experiment in a new form of exchange yeah. in the form of Seva Cafe. Uh, so very yeah. briefly, can you just spend a little time on that interim before yeah. we go to sacred sure, capital sure. and the world you're sure. trying, the new world that yeah. you're trying to be part of. Sure. Um, and I will also say like some of this could be, you know, for people who would want to jump into those conversations more, there's a ton of videos and podcasts and, you know, blogging that I did myself back then. And um, But for me, it was about jumping into a new way of being almost, um, you know, undoing the last 20 years of being in this, you know, capitalist frame of mind. Um, and and I, and I understood that simplifying my monetary footprint was a very important part of that puzzle. And so, you know, spending time in the Sabarmati Ashram was Sid, how old was were you important. at that time when you moved from... 29. You 29, you, 29. Okay, when you moved yeah. to a, a Gandhi Ashram. Okay, yeah. go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, so you could say the early half part of my 30s was, you know, when I spent time in the Ashram. And um, I was... I You could say I was like a sponge because, you know, all those years of conditioning in business school and the trading flow, I was very keen to understand more. Um, Sabarmati Ashram at that point of time was one of the few re remaining institute, Gandhian institutions that still had an influx of young people, you know, and, and was vibrant, whereas the average age in other ashrams is about 95. Um, and I quite enjoyed hanging out with the 95 year olds as well. Um, um, but I think on a daily basis, I, I really cherished, you know, some of the vibrancy and the youth that I found in Sabarmati Ashram. Um, and so what took me there was actually reading Gandhi's auto autobiography. Um, and, and it was almost like, a, oh my God, Sid, you're such an idiot. Like you relied on these, on these um, readings of Gandhi and nonviolence um, which were not entirely true. Like they were like a very filtered, almost biased versions. Uh, and you know, this, you know, growing up in India in the 19 and early 2000s it was fashionable to hate on Gandhi. Like it was so uncool. Like, do you want to be a jhola wala and a khadi wearer? Like, um, and so there was this countercultural side of me that really enjoyed, you know, diving into this. Like maybe it is really interesting to see what people were hating on for so many decades. And I was very touched by the authenticity of Gandhi. Like, I don't think I shared some of the romanticism about Gandhi as Gandhi is like putting him on a pedestal, but I was like, oh my God, the courage to talk about this, to do these things, to live, you know, as per what you believe. That was definitely what I was moved by and touched by. For the first time, I engaged in an un, you know conversations about nonviolence in a way that I had not before um, for one I think it washed away my understanding of you know this very watered down version or maybe even abused or maybe even bastardized version of nonviolence um, which I almost feel ashamed for having held you know 20 years ago um, but it helped me understand like the true essence of nonviolence um, and it is so not like a, an, a you know an, a tool for coercion. Um, and very interestingly, today I find that in Western societies, where nonviolence is seen more as a strategy rather than a principled approach towards life. Um, and I wonder if you know Western society needs a little rethink of their understanding of Gandhi and nonviolence. And maybe Rajni, these conversations, maybe you hold a role somewhere there. Uh, but I, I really hope that it happens. I don't think that person is me. I think you know it might be 
you know people like you um but i do think it has been deeply misunderstood or not the the essence of nonviolence and the strength that lies in it has not been fully understood by the world um it's almost been you know people are almost look at it in a very disney way of life like a very postmodern lens through look at is it is it a, a reductionist thing that you're referring to here that some reductionism has happened for sure i think it is also one i think it the experience of nonviolence came in that context of a poor india fighting against the mighty british and so what other option did they have really um you know it's 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 seen and embraced by the liberals for that reason like oh these warm fluffy people embrace nonviolence um and won but again you know it's also tempered with a uh, but really they won because the you know world war 2 and the british were ready to leave um and so i don't think people understand the vulnerability that nonviolence entails when you do embrace nonviolence there is a vulnerability you have no idea you're not vested in winning or losing you have no you could be very horribly hurt and i think that requires a strength and and courage of the heart that i think most people do not internalize um and so it is seen as a strategic ploy is it because there's a paradox here that it is a vulnerability that is anchored in a, a deep and unshakable strength mm exactly like it cannot be taken away right that's right and i think in that sense you also you know potentially entering a situation disarmed who does that um and yeah i think entering the ashram for me was very humbling because it washed away these intellectual frameworks it it helped me see how i could potentially weave nonviolence into my own organized relationships i think is a better way of framing it um and was this only your personal relationships but or also your relationship with the material world uh, of your times was it both yeah that's a maybe this i'm reflecting on it right on the fly so let's let's see where this goes yeah i think definitely with relationships um i also think with the world there was this almost a sense of surrender of like you know i want to do something i want to create something i want to create some kind of systemic change and i'm not doing it to be successful um and in that sense we are making ourselves more vulnerable right um i should reframe that i'm not saying i'm i didn't want to be successful i i entered into that journey with a sense of this is required i don't know why and i don't know if i will win um but i think there is a certain joy associated with finding that battle worth finding that hill worth dying on um and i think that requires a certain amount of nonviolence because you are disarming you know in that process um and so i think there's a steadfastness in nonviolence that is very very attractive and not in a cheesy way but i think i i wish more people would open to that i wish a larger understanding of it um, so is this yeah. what gave you the courage then to come back into because you could have potentially you know gone into an ngo you could after the from the gandhi ashram mm. experience you could have mm. just gone and done some a uh, very tangible very immediate work that um, brought happiness and well-being to x number mm. of lives which you could visibly see um uh, instead you came back in a sense into the mainstream and mm. you have been now i think 10 years uh trying to be part of in a sense the next generation work mm. on changing the system itself so mm. was it this was it this grounding in your new understanding of ahimsa that gave you the courage to do this 
I hadn't thought about it until now. Um, <laughs> but maybe, maybe that you're right. Like I think when we do approach life with the non-violence, right? Like you actually embrace life with when you disarm and say, you know, what is it that I have to do? And you stop because when you are in the Gandhi Ashram as well, you know, there's a certain, as with most places, there's certain biases with which you view the world, like any kind of embrace of commerce, materialism is negative. Any kind of return to the old world is negative. You know, it's the, as, as you can imagine. And so I think it took me as much courage to start piecing together this project, knowing fully well, it might take me into places where I could make mistakes. Um, but I wasn't vested in being ideologically safe. Um, and that was very, very important to me. And, and I will say I also faced a fair amount of judgment from um, fellow travelers in the ashram. Um, and so yeah, in, the, in a place that romanticizes nonviolence, you can also witness a lot of emotional violence there. Um, and I continue to. So I think it's I think true nonviolence is that, you know, very ephemeral space that could or can only be accessed when you're being brutally authentic and vulnerable. Um, and and non-judgmental towards that. others. Yes, exactly. Which fully clashes against a teenage Sid's notion of nonviolence because nonviolence was that very judgmental. So, Thanks, so yeah. did I understand this correctly, Sid? On the one hand, you were facing, uh, well, not disapproval, but perhaps the kind of disappointment of your peer group in the ashram community. And on the other hand, I'm sure you were met with very strong reactions by your former peers in the market because yeah. you, you were now yeah, trying yeah. to do something that was neither there nor here. I mean, it was yeah. something that was yeah. didn't fit in any known paradigm. So still does just, not fit. And I think most people are confused. That's right. <laughs> and I think so, most people can't like I can still see, you know, often talking to investors, they're trying to place or at least in my early days trying to place like, is this guy not good for the world or bad for the world? Because if he's bad for the world, I'm willing to fund him. But if he's good for the world, like I, I can give him a donation. And so there's this confusion because this polar polarity exists in all of us. Yeah. And I think today, obviously, that polarism, polarity has, polarization has come to the surface and it's become much more apparent. Yeah. I think it's existed for a while there. Yeah. So, Sid, in a very basic sense, what then mm. were you trying to do in this new space that you were trying to create in, say, now 10 years ago? And where has that mm. journey landed you today? Can you mm. explain that in ways that people who are not familiar with these efforts would easily mm -hmm. be able to relate to? Mm. why sacred well, I think back then yeah yeah why um I think when that seed for initiating this or even that seed for when I moved to the ashram it was always an understanding of oh my god the old economic system is outdated it has been designed 200 years ago with an understanding that was that is today outdated for people that, you know, I think today, if you met someone from 200 years ago, you just wouldn't relate to them because they are so, you know, we are so different. And we still use the plumbing from that time. And that seems, uh, that seemed absurd to me. So it very clearly felt like back in 2008 and nine and 10, like we're still living in a house with plumbing from 200 years ago. And so this plumbing needs to be changed. And I like that it is not glamorous changing plumbing. Um, because I think too many people get into this work with the glamour and when you frame it as changing plumbing, it is so not. Um, so I would say that is that is the effort here. How do we change update the plumbing of this global house that we sit in to more accurately reflect who we are as people? Um, and so Which that plumbing is... Sorry, in that more accurately reflect who we are as people, I think mm. you mean perhaps as a species, which would mm. mean that, uh, so correct me if I'm wrong, that we are capable as much of competition as of cooperation. Mm. As much, uh, we do have an inclination to violence, but we have an equal or stronger inclination to non-violence. So mm. is it this complexity that your effort strives to embrace? rather than mm. projecting see because that 200 year old system 
is based on a one dimensional view yeah that yep. we are fundamentally greedy and uh, conquering kind of species and that's good because that's what moves yeah. things uh, around yeah yeah and and so yeah. you are a trying to counter that world view um mm. am i correct did, did i represent it uh, accurately i yeah i think there's different you could say different memes or different mental frameworks or different ways you can look at i think what you describe is accurate like that is i think there is that flavor to that it flavor to it as well so almost like you know yin and yang so we've created the the, the yang and now we're looking at the yin um you know we've created formal economic systems for the very masculine but we've not created formal economic systems for the feminine um and so every you know one of the problems we try to solve every problem in that one dimension and so i think you know in a very physics term it's like kinetic and potential energy and you know i'm a circuit systems designer and so you understand like the play of yin and yang but if all you have is just kinetic energy you can't build systems like you build stupid systems um and so i think there is that perspective to it um another one that has been more alive for me of late is understanding that uh, we're moving from that industrial revolution towards a more informational era and that requires like information isn't the same as stuff like material capital um and one of the issues with you know i i see a lot of today issues in the world because we're applying this outdated system on fundamentally informational capital um and so which is why you tend to look at information and use it as a resource as a new kind of gold or a new kind of data and so you see these new tech empires forming because what is it like facebook's code today is not you know it should ideally be replicated there's no cost to replicating it but why are these trillion dollar empires being created around it so i think it is the function a function of outdated thinking on you know where we are today so um yeah so in some ways also thinking about what is an economic system for informational era looking like and covid has accelerated because our footprint has gone so much further into the informational realm um and and yeah i think creating systems around it has been interesting i think it links quite a bit with with gandhian thoughts for me because you know in the ashram there's this idealism around non violence that you hold and i was always holding this friction around oh i can't you know if i create a system it's going to create violence in this way and that way and that way and so i like the way both gandhi and vinoba frame their understanding of systems and while non violence and i might be paraphrasing but i think gandhi said something like organizing or creating systems is an opportunity to practice non violence um whereas vinoba said all kind of organizing all kinds of systems will create violence um and i think they're true both true um and so i think understanding that if i am vested in creating a system in creating plumbing it's by very nature i will affect violence on people um like this is like that is the nature of organizing um and so one being okay with it but two understanding systems are less likely to create violence when they are appropriate um it is when we use these outdated systems in a non contextual ways or create like these highly uncontextual systems that just get smashed onto entire countries of billion people that starts creating violence um and so today i you know with the with with we're looking at an economic system the industrial revolution economic system which is out of whack and needs to perpetuate its growth rate purely for survival and will you know is happier to destroy the earth rather than um you know transition out um because it needs you know it wants to sustain itself and so i think who was it i think it was slavoj zizek who said it is easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism um and and as people like today all of us buying our mutual funds are imagining a much more happier 
saying yeah it might end the world but no capitalism can't end because what is the alternative right like we've been we've been conditioned to believe that right um so so, and so, so this is, go ahead go yeah. ahead you've complete what you're saying so i think at a very deep level and we we don't have to linger at this level but i think a lot of that system came from very european settler colonial roots where scale of where was thought about very i think very contextual in that environment um where scale was a function of accumulation um and you and of material accumulation material accum- accumulation specifically and so i i think what we have to understand is like scale and coordination can come without in different ways um and i think this new era requires us to let go of some of that settler colon colonizer mindset and embrace new ways of coordinating and scaling um and i can and i can touch on what i think those are and you yeah. know how that's influenced our design process um but i think that is the big shift like that move away from a notion of growth these assumptions we make the way we have you know if we have to you know solve a problem like covid or global warming we have to buy into the settler colonizer you know way of scaling and coordinating there's no other way i think that's the big assumption we are breaking really here yeah. um so in this context it why sacred capital um i could make up a long reason but there isn't one um <laughs> <laughs> it just felt right and in a way i could sense there was a polarity polarization in the world and in economics and so smashing these words together sacred and capital felt like a very countercultural um almost facetious thing to do yeah. and so sacred you know, capital oh. can i tell you what it has always <laughs> yeah. resonated why it has resonated for me always mm-hmm. is because mm-hmm. uh wealth and abundance are two mm-hmm. different things all wealth mm-hmm. doesn't lead to abundance Mm. I mean or rather let's put it this way accumulation of material wealth doesn't automatically mean abundance. Mm. Uh also abundance is a much more holistic term because it includes the quality of air you breathe, the quality of mm. water you are able to drink, uh, the the, mm. the the surroundings, the ecosystem in which you are able to exist and in which you have food, shelter, clothing. Mm. healthcare mm, etc mm, mm. so uh, to me your choice of the word sacred always implied all of that that is a fantastic segue into you could say the origins of sacred capital it's the intersections with a project called holochain and with distributed ledger technology um because back in 2014 15 when the foundations for sacred capital were forming we could start you know blockchain technology but i think the much deeper and transformation there called distributed ledger technology was emerging and so these notions you know what you just described were often romantic notions right like you know or talked about in workshops and with like you know retreats um and that exploration stayed there because we had not developed that technology to start articulating these deeper forms of wealth and so at that point you know conversations with some of the founders of holochain helped steer me in this direction where you know a few light bulbs went off you know where where i was like oh my god all all along now like we only had the technology to validate material capital and that was the european system right like uh, you know create a nation state the nation state creates laws we maintains records of who gave how, whom how many gold coins or how many cattle and so on and and records were maintained now obviously that is expensive and which is why you only maintain records of material capital but it's also highly centralized um you can you know it's and it brings us back to the original view of consensus or like a very universal view towards things um and and so we only had systems that tracked and validated material capital but like you just described there is so much there is this entire depth of value that we were not articulating um systems in asia as you've outlined in many of your literature in your book um in asia you had cultural systems to articulate things like reputational capital and social fabric and those have existed for millennia 
but they always had these this baggage associated of it which you know i spoke about early in my life which was tribalism communalism uh patriarchy um you know all of that um and so we moved we've always stayed in that that realm of validating material capital but now because of distributed ledgers or technologies like holochain we can actually validate a much wider spectrum of value and so in in more digital environments things like sid liked rajni's photo that might have no monetary value to it associated with it immediately but it is important it indicates a bunch of things um and so now we can validate and maintain records of it in very interesting ways so something as simple as you know is rajni punctual or not um was never really a form of wealth but something like that can become a form of wealth not just because of the technology to capture it but because of the contextual ways in which we can validate it like i think to have a universal snapshot of rajni is punctual and all must say that she is punctual is is worse but i think instead we now have like a very con- ways of holding that information very contextually and so all of this like leads us to the possibilities of validating a much broader spectrum of value and that plugs into my conversation of oh my god we can actually update that settler colonizer system into one which works with informational capital because information is fundamentally not material it's not the same as cows and gold coins it is it is much subtler it actually doesn't have a material footprint unless it's stored in a hard drive um and, and it's so, inexhaustible yeah there, so there it are, has if, we, if we say one it's one gold it's, coin it can either yeah. be in your hand or in my hand yeah yeah but so it has potentially potentially non zero sum values to it that's right and that starts unlocking unbelievable potential like collaboration like if you put a group of people in a room and say i'm going to reward you with a pot of gold in the center that pot of gold has limited capacity like it's zero sum and so immediately you will see how it distorts people behavior into thinking like oh i win at the expense of them but if you start rewarding them with reputational capital um ideation can thrive a lot more collaboration can thrive more so a lot of these notions of we must be collaborative now start becoming real and i think it is very important and by real what do i mean by real i think it is important for us to design a system where something like collaboration is not the fair play award you know that you win on the side or like the critics choice award what needs to be front and center like i think i am tired of sitting through seminars and conversations and i'm sure as a you rajni like you've been in this game much longer than i have where we're really just doing lip service to these values and you, you know that it's just you know often even used as a tool to perpetuate bad behaviors um but i think it is actually time for us to create plumbing where these values are front and center um and i think that happens when we update and start moving towards these informational era economic systems um where it is actually in a sustainable way way more rewarding like like orders of magnitude more rewarding to be collaborative yeah. um and some of those designs we're seeing with us with our own building like you know open sourcing a lot more of our code um our project is rolling out through a container called neighborhoods and and playing with neighborhoods almost as a meme so people can fork it can you know change some of the visuals the designs and as opposed to like us holding the secret sauce of it um yeah. and so i think it's creating more meme like economies is a playful way to describe it could you yeah. explain that term sid just in case uh, because to many people the term meme like may not be very very uh, mm. familiar before we go on yeah, to exactly so, what is happening today in in sacred capital um yeah it's very interesting like i think meme i the word meme has obviously gained uh, more acceptance in the last decade but i think of the word meme as a single unit of culture mm-hmm. so like a cent is a unit of monetary capital i think a meme is the one unit okay uh, and it refers to like a unit of culture unit of 
idea like it's it's it i would say it belongs to the cultural economy so you might have a monetary economy but you also have a cultural economy and the unit of account in that is a meme uh, and memes are very interesting and obviously we experience them through social media and whatsapp and instagram today but you have a central template an idea but its beauty is in the fact lies in the fact that it can be forked and people can twist it tweak it add their flavor to it and that's how culture works yes um culture doesn't work with like everyone circulating the same joke um and so i think there is a much larger conversation to be unpacked there where we're unleashing a new form of scaling and scaling in the cultural economy looks very different it doesn't look like an oil company setting out and you know profiting from all of these rigs that it has around the world i think the cultural economy scales or the informational economy scales more like a language like and and i think india indians understand this because my reading of i mean over the, i would say over the last 2000 years a lot of scaling across india occurred through the use of language um, like let's say something like sanskrit like you have a very well determined grammar once you buy into the grammar you can say what you want you can construct your own words there's no central ledger or dictionary of like the queen says this is a word um but you have to adopt grammar and i think it creates scale while allowing for variance and diversity and so you had all of these regions in india that were radically diverse you couldn't really say horrifically diverse like from an organizing point of view like even something like the ramayan right like how many forked versions of there are like there's like 200000 versions of it it's chaotic it's it's almost silly at some level um and so but we could still coordinate because we used very good grammar and protocols at the center and so informational economies scale with good grammar and that's very interesting because what you're really doing is like orchestrating and modulating the cultural economy more than the material economy and so to connect back to your yin yang example i think what we're moving towards is not just european settler material economy growth but i think an interplay between material and cultural economy and so you're looking at scale as a language and not scale as accumulation of material resources um Fantastic. which i think for system thinkers there this it's a very interesting point or you know conversation jump in at some point um but to me that's what's exciting about what we're building over the next 5 10 15 years uh, like i would say it's a new kind of scaling and therefore a new kind of economic system so said if someone were to say i want to come on board sacred capital today yeah what would that mean uh, mm. both as a uh, say that somebody just wants to be part of this journey that's one category yeah, yeah. Uh, because yeah. they want to be part of uh, building a world uh, that is not living on the edge of chaos mm. uh, or mm. at, at any rate a world a world that is less threatened by climate chaos and mm. other forms of mm. Mm. Uh, and many many forms of inequity uh so one is the people who want to be part of building a more uh, uh, humane world mm. the other is somebody who wants to come in as an investor what mm. does sacred capital um do yeah. uh, do or uh, you know in what ways yeah, can they just, come maybe i can just lay it out in a more tangible way like what please, is what please. is it more so sacred capital over the last few years has been building you could say infrastructure like the plumbing for and so a big chunk of it is reputational infrastructure and you know is at the heart of it is something called a reputation interchange or something called the cultural computer of sorts um which allows any group of people you know irrespective of how big or small they are to articulate their culture or their reputation system in distributed ledgers like holochain in agent centric ledgers like holochain um 
and we haven't been able to do that today you know if you want to create your own community or micro network and record that information like it takes you hundreds of thousands of dollars and so we end up having our conversations in a facebook or a whatsapp where you don't have agency over your culture like zuckerberg is imposing his culture on you because he wants to monetize your eyeballs and so we've actually been stripped of this cultural sovereignty just for access to simple tools um and similarly like you know participating in global commerce today you can't articulate your culture you have to participate in like this you know the organization's culture the global culture in order to benefit monetarily so that this infrastructure we've built allows for this to occur and so all of this is manifesting through a large project called neighborhoods where what we're saying is over the last 20 years or how many of i mean decades we've used apps or we've used businesses in you know to socially coordinate with each other um but now that we have formally articulated culture and reputation systems you're seeing new kinds of social structures emerge and we say they could be neighborhoods and we're using neighborhoods with a capital n something we're naming it but it's basically specific culture generic tools is a neighborhood whereas businesses or apps are generic culture specific tools like you go to facebook to have a commun- conversation with your community you know it might be a community of 50000 people but you can't articulate your culture you know you can't control who's showing up in there what order they're showing up and you have to buy into a generic culture of zuckerbergs um and so neighborhoods flips that on its head which basically means everything from commercial activity to discovering each other through to conversations happens through social networks through little, these little social organisms and so you don't need companies and non-profits and governments to coordinate you can actually do it through these mimetic tribes as it were like these formally where culture is formally articulated um and so i think it creates this new kind of commerce and i think picking from your book again this notion of a bazaar which is commerce that is embedded in social fabric um and so you have these very interesting scenarios that could emerge where you know if i have limes in my backyard i might want to offer them to the 50 communities i'm part of and maybe for 10 communities i offer it as a gift for five i offer it at a discount and maybe for the others it's market price and so this cross membrane coordination um starts occurring so i think it's a fantastic contrast to global markets where in global markets i would be trading and arbitraging against someone i have no idea who they are because everyone is stripped of their cultural identity in the global market but in in bazaars we are very much embedded in social fabric and in fact it actually becomes a guiding principle um and because it's formally articulated in ledgers um it it steers us away from some of the problems that you know young teenage sid or 11 year old sid was wary of um which is tribalism and moralism and so uh, yeah but there's another factor here no said that uh in the conventional market market uh mm. the only thing that you are dealing with is either money mm-hmm. or some form of material commodity yes which could be petrol yes. it could be gold it could be i don't know yep. silica yeah uh, yep. whereas here what is being traded is also hmm. giving us a firstly i think you're moving away from money alone hmm am i right yeah you could so some people have called us post monetary economies um right but, so that's what could you explain yeah. that a bit more yeah so i would say we have created a new dimension of i mean not we as in like just us uh, but i think these new technologies are creating a new dimension for what we call wealth so obviously the monetary dimension is very well known it could be money it could be stuff like cattle or coin or, or you know and so on and reputation capital 
is also receiving that new dimension, that formally articulated dimension. And because of the reputation infrastructure we built, this starts becoming much more easier. And so communities don't have to you know, face friction in doing it. Um, and so for coordination, like you said, all decisions don't occur just on this dimension. Like, you know, and when it just occurs on one dimension, I don't care about being nice. I just want to extract most money from you right now. And that's it. Or even things like let's solve the climate crisis by perpetuating the growth machine all happens on that dimension, which is just absurd. But because we have a new dimension, we can now start creating organizing across both dimensions, or maybe just on this dimension, which can be, you know, which is, I would say, a, a much less violent way of doing things like a simple thing like today for solving the climate crisis, we do need behavioral change and that behavioral change for that to start happening through micro organizing and through micro communities is very critical as opposed to just saying we're going to charge people for buying a plastic bag because, you know, that's that's how we think everything gets solved these days. Yeah. Um, and 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 so you have new dimensions to solve these problems. Um, and I actually think the informational economy moves more towards the reputational dimension because like we said, it's, it's, it has a very little material footprint. Um, and so obviously early open source communities have dabbled with this, but never had the formality of doing it. And which is why, you know, could always be appropriated, could always, you know, run out of steam. But now with formal reputation systems, we can actually interplay between both and start validating. Okay. So uh, up to here, yeah. uh, it's uh, it's a very hopeful scenario, but <laughs> but there's a big but that yeah. uh, the climate chaos that now threatens and also now post COVID mm. uh, the depth mm. of poverty into which mm. hundreds of millions of people are being pushed mm. uh, that requires surely macro. Uh, adjustments, you know, macro changes. So, I mean, mm. in that sense, uh, you know, don't print your receipt at the ATM is a very misleading mm. uh, way yeah. of, uh, you know, telling somebody yeah. that by doing this, they are part of the effort <laughs> to stem climate <laughs> yeah. change. Yeah. Uh, because yeah. until we are able to do something about the, uh, the fact that the macro global economy is still deeply invested, not only mm. in old ways, of uh, the carbon economy, but is finding new ways to grow the carbon economy. Mm -hmm, and as we mm -hmm, speak, mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, for, and even if we uh, move away from the carbon issue for a moment, the way that this deep sea is now being mined, these are how any, any even the most creative action by billions of individuals in their personal life is not going to change what we are, you know, uh, uh, doing to uh, at the macro level. So, mm. and I know that I know that you deal with these frustrations or what these challenges mm. in personally mm. or very preoccupied with them. Yeah. Um, yeah. How do you a live with it at your own uh, as a as an individual? These these this profound anomaly that we are confronted with, uh, mm. uh, and and what is some glimmer even of hope that the striving for a less violent mm. macro economy or at least mm. some mm. shift in the structural violence we can effect say in the next 10, 20 mm -hmm. years. So my analysis of where we are in the world a few years ago was that the, pro the problem is we don't know where to go to. We don't know, we don't have new systems for social coordination at scale. And so we are defaulting to this outdated one, which creates some of the problems that you just outlined. Um, and so from that analysis, it you know obviously pushed me personally to say, well, then we have to create those solutions, the new, those new ways of coordinating. Um, and I don't imagine that we will be the only one. I think in that future, it will be dozens uh, and maybe, or maybe hundreds. And from hundreds, you'll have like a dozen that survive. Um, and so I'm very much in that spectrum of we need to create those systems. And so 
for us it's yeah we have the next four to five years to take this to you know some kind of scale but when we think about scale like i said we think about ourselves as a language and so replication or you know reson you know resonance carries this forward um and it's almost like we rely on virality more than marketing right like and and so we do have faith in the fact that once this you know the virus this is these are these are bad metaphors to use at this point of time but if this virus <laughs> catches on at this point of time um in, in some meaningful way its replication is you know is is a is a hockey stick it's a you know an inflect and once the inflection point is hit the scaling effects are very very fast because we're primarily informational today and and so i think that is a benefit of the last 20 30 40 years of work we have on tech and technology because the replication today is really that fast um you could see things catching on within months if not years um and so i do think the world is tilted in a way where we're much better off building something that works rather than worrying about how do we get enough people to buy in um because i think those compromises have not led us to a good situation um on the other hand i actually hold a very <laughs> counter intuitive view around the mainstream economy where i think an increasing footprint in the digital world is deflationary um and that is actually one of the bigger problems that the global market is contending with because if people you know for the last 2 years and it looks like for another few years are not traveling around as much as they used to and going on cruise ships like they used to how are we going to sustain this um and i think that is very much in place um and so even you know so i think everything from the amount of coordination that we're now doing virtually like these kinds of conversations is a massive problem that the global market is contending with and there's a, almost like a it's called a kayfabe it's like you know um um in 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 wrestling like wwe and wwf like i grew up watching everyone knows it's fake but you still kind of go with it um growth i think markets have accepted that um but growth is being perpetuated through a devaluation of sovereign currencies so i think we are already in that territory where yeah the emperor has no clothes but let's go with it for a while because what else do we have like there's no other way of coordinating so my stance has actually moved to i i think the growth market the paternal the patriarch has seen that you know it has to go it's just waiting for that new new system to transition to that isn't a rosy picture i think that comes with a certain set of violence as the transition occurs um and because the transition I'm is not, likely to be turbulent likely to be because possibly chaotic in this in this yeah in this palliative phase we are seeing inequality shooting through the roof i think it is going to accelerate to never seen before levels i think we're already in never seen before levels i think it's going to continue i think the lack of solutions for the climate crisis will continue to hit i think the growth market wanting to perpetuate its illusion of growth will will affect violence on some communities um and so in that sense my picture is very bleak but it's also rosy in the sense like i think we are in that territory of palliative like you know the end is violent but it but it is the end like it is that the start of a new era that is coming at some point in this decade um so it's it's a very weird bitter sweet optimism because on one hand i feel plugged into like these new systems that are working and show potential but on the other hand i see some of the disaster and calamity as inevitable which might potentially harm me my family my loved ones my community my you know my my tribe my all of that and i think tuning into that and being smart about it as opposed to rattling the or like chiming the bell of like social justice i think actually doing something about it for you know being smart about it i think is the order of is the order of the day in my opinion mm -hmm. um so 
Yeah, I say it's bittersweet because I see I see these new systems and that excites me. But at the same time, I realize that we have a turbulent phase ahead of us, which who knows how that will land. Perhaps there are parallels to the independence um, in India, because on one hand, independence was achieved, but there was certain violence that we had to go through. And I think those are, you know, it's that kind of time. And I and I think back to my grandparents. Sindhis moving over the border. And from my conversations with them, it was sudden overnight that they had to pack up and leave. And I always wonder, what were you thinking? Why didn't you, you know, plan months and years in advance? And I think that's a very interesting um, data point for me that when chaos comes, it comes, it's a, you know, it's a sharp fall off. Um, and I think not accepting that might be one of the large must might be one of the biggest mistakes we make as a, as a people. So, but, you know, it's, like I said, it's, it's weird because at the same time, like, wow, we, you know, back in 1947, it was like, wow, we got independence. We're getting independence, but at the same time, few million people are going to die in this violence. Um, and, and yeah, and I think the sooner we tune into that, the more I think we'll be able to avoid some of the violence, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. So, Sid, in closing, what <laughs> what feelings or insights would you share with, say, somebody who is in their early 20s today and maybe mm. is in a very similar mood to where you were in 2008 or 9? That because mm. I meet a lot of young people who are geared, they want to be part of building the new world and they recognize mm. that the old world isn't working, mm. that it's mm. not going to get our species mm. to the end of this century, you know, in any reasonably mm. Mm. Whole, whole manner. Uh, mm. But they, and, and a lot of them are instinctively drawn towards ways and means of cultivating nonviolence, but they also feel daunted. Mm. So what yeah. are some of the personal strengths? What are some of the uh, anchors that you know you would recommend or suggest from your own experience? What can they build upon? Don't listen to previous generations. <laughs> I'm just being I'm being a little naughty in saying that, but yeah, like I think my generation suffers because we are on that cusp, right? Like we have conditioning from previous generations. And so this millennial generation, I often think of ourselves as this bunny generation that is like stuck between like the old and the new. And I think some of the newer generations like, and this I think about with, with our daughter as well, like how can we raise, raise her as an agent of chaos? Like I think they, they come into this world of chaos. I think the biggest issue is when you uh, don't accept the chaos, right? Like you keep wondering, oh, why is there a chaos? Like, why can't we have it like our parents? And that's, I think, my generation. Like we all, you know, we're still resenting the chaos. But I think younger generations will be more accepting of this chaos and more agents of chaos. And so I really hope they can lean into that chaos more, listen less to people, you know, to previous generations conditioning. Um, and by that, I don't mean like going out and doing crazy things, but and but and obviously, I think that bridge should exist within generations. But yeah, I think leaning more into what some of the intuitions are suggesting, and I think the kind of skill sets that they would need to me, like a very high level, like I think the skill set of the future is under a speaking as many cultural languages as possible like the intellectual capacities that develop when you hop from one cultural way of being and i don't mean like you know community like language and tribe you know like the way we've known in the past but i think there's different ways of being and i think being able to hop from one to another is going to be a skill set of the future because they are not going to have that benefit of the one world one shared set of values that globalism allowed us I think we're breaking off into different ways that will be different tribes that will be communicating and coordinating with each other. 
but that means for you like the skill set of the future is is are these new cultural capacities um but what does yeah. ahimsa mean then in this new in this attuned to chaos kind of uh, world that you are visualizing for your daughter wh- what will ahimsa what possibly can ahimsa mean in in lived practice i don't mean in some abstract yeah, yeah. sense it's a good question um i f- i i don't think like i like i said before i don't by by what you of creating a system you are affecting violence right like you know that a system for social coordination cannot exist without creating some kind of violence like it is a structure um but in moving to this new system or new way of being i do think there is no violence of old system being applied in the new like i think yeah a good way to frame it would be embracing contextuality like like whole contextuality as your central value and and move towards that so it means systems that are far more resilient far more fluid far more adaptive um uh, and that's what the informational economy looks like to me i think that will end up creating less violence in the new world as compared to the old very monolithic system that sits and tries to coerce a bunch of people together um and so to me that looks like less enforcement and more mediation and to some people for example who you know i see it in social justice today like i would love to see more mediation and less enforcement um and to me a lot of social justice conversations you know intersect back to you know what i experienced in the 90s with the jhola walas and the khadi walas and and i think it is especially in the world that we're entering there is no universal consensus there is coordination through what we say mimetic bridges which is cultural bridges and so if there is another culture that doesn't abide by your moral framework um learn how to mediate rather than enforcing um enforce your view on them you mean enforce your view on them um and mediation requires vulnerability because um like we said that's what ahimsa really is right like you are entering a conversation with say a trump supporter not like full knowing fully well that you aren't looking to coerce them into your view but trying to understand what their mindset might be um and so many others and 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 yeah so i think that shift from enforcement to mediation might be a hinsa in the world to come beautiful Mm. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.